Tasmania is Australia's smallest state, an island lying some 240 kilometres southeast of the mainland. Isolated during the last ice age, the state has developed its own unique and diverse ecology. A multitude of plants and animals. They proliferate among towering mountain peaks and diverse tracts of unspoiled wilderness. From some of the most rugged coastlines on earth to dense temperate rainforests. Tasmania's unique natural beauty, born of long isolation, harbours thriving industries, supplying the world with fresh premium quality produce, internationally acclaimed wines, agricultural products such as beef, cheeses and venison, specialty fruits, a variety of seafoods, including Atlantic salmon which are commercially farmed around the coast. And in this haven for such rich produce live the inimitable wild trout. There are four types in Tasmanian waters. The brook trout. A wild population is established at Clarence Lagoon on the central plateau and they're being introduced to lakes on the west coast. Some are still held at the Inland Fisheries Commission hatchery. In their native habitat, brook trout grow to about half a kilogram. However, fish of up to four kilograms have been taken from Clarence Lagoon. The Atlantic Salmon. Farmed commercially in sea cages around Tasmania's coastline, the Atlantic Salmon is an important export. Wild populations have never been established, either in lakes or at sea. They're successfully maintained in captivity. So inland waters are stocked, while escapees from sea farms are present in many bays and estuaries. The Rainbow Trout. This fish too is farmed commercially in sea farms and inland hatcheries are well established. Rainbows inhabit many waters. Farm dams are stocked while self-maintaining populations exist in many lakes. They're not common in rivers and don't compete well against the brown trout in the wild. They are regarded by many as the best of Tasmania's freshwater sporting fish. And the wild brown trout. Originally from Europe, but now distributed around the world, the wild brown was introduced to Tasmania in 1864. It's common in most lakes and rivers as well as farm dams, and sea run fish occur in many estuaries. The state record fish was captured in 1887, weighing 13.27 kilograms. Although the record hasn't fallen yet, fish close to this size are often caught in the Huon River and Lake Crescent. Tasmania's fishing has become legendary, luring fishermen the world over to the state's pristine water, wishing to experience the thrill of the catch. The spirit of the wild brown and rainbow trout makes for superb sport, and Tasmania is one of the best places to catch such fighting fish. The island offers the fishermen many benefits. The fish are never far away in Tasmania. The state's small size makes it possible to escape to untamed primeval wilderness while only being a short travelling time away from civilization. In Tasmania we're lucky in that we don't suffer from a lot of the uh, fishing pressure that some other states of Australia have. Uh, nowhere in the state are you any more than about 50 kilometres from some form of water. An abundance of boat ramps. Uh, you can go fishing any day here and not see another person. For the visit to the state um, with a view to fishing, whether they be interested in game fishing or just a spot of trout fishing or even just wetting a line estuary of fishing, there are plenty of options available. This boat ramp is a good example. It's 25 minutes drive from the city of Hobart um, and from here you can uh, be in some of the state's best flathead fishing, Australian salmon fishing, even Atlantic salmon can be caught in this area and another half an hour's drive further on south you could be at the Huon River, one of the state's top trout fishing rivers, all within an hour's drive of Hobart.
as members of the Bottom End Sport Fishing Club, we don't just concentrate on on saltwater fishing. We also have uh, half of our competitions throughout the year are normally trout fishing comps. Um, we have probably one of the world's best, if not the best, wild trout fisheries in the world. However, it's not quite as easy as just finding some water and throwing a line in. We do suggest that you get in touch with some of the local trout guides, the local tackle shops, or one of the fishing clubs in the state to get some information on local conditions. And please, if you're coming to Tasmania trout fishing, be aware of the weather, it is very changeable. And we have had quite a number of fishermen have been caught uh, due to unexpected weather changes. So it's a ma mainly a matter of preparation, making sure that you have the correct clothing with you and be prepared for anything. Styles of accommodation vary greatly. Upmarket fishing lodges with private waters are available. Maybe after that we go down to Samuel. Well, the uh, London Lakes fishery is a, a fishery established for people seeking some uh, privacy in angling and to be able to find that joy that they can get from their fishing in surroundings which uh, are private, uh, where there's good fishing. And we've created a, a fishery here which, which does have some superb dry fly fishing. The lodge accommodates 10 people. Those 10 people can enjoy the, the uh, 2,000 hectares of wildlife habitat and 11 kilometres of foreshore, including all its shallow, uh, wadeable waters for dry fly fishing. That goes to make a wonderful uh, fly fishing experience. Chalets and hotels offer a wide choice, and camping facilities are established in many areas. Getting to Tasmania is easy, with airlines and ferries commuting regularly. And once in Tasmania, professional guides, friendly locals, or inland fishery staff can guide you to the waters of your choice. Armed with a map, finding your way around is not difficult. The diversity of fishing is very impressive. There are shallows and marshes, idling streams, rushing rivers, and lakes and tarns, offering you some of the best fishing in the world. The World Fly Fishing Championships were held here in 1989, testimony to the standard of fishing. The championships are the apex of prestige fishing, and this occasion was the first time the event has ever been held outside of waters in the Northern Hemisphere. Many participants have since returned. So impressed was the International Fishing Fraternity with the sport Tasmania's waters and wild fish have to offer. The grandeur, quality and quantity of waters is incredible. Tasmania's central highlands are known as the land of 3,000 lakes. Tasmania's weather, even at the height of summer, can be very changeable. It's not uncommon to experience a taste of all four seasons several times over in the one day. So carrying adequate clothing for any eventuality is best, especially in the Tasmanian highlands. Boat fishing should be practiced with great heed for the weather. Inland waters are notoriously dangerous in certain conditions. Generally, the trout fishing season begins the weekend closest to August the 1st each year. The months no fishing is permitted are during winter in June and July. Early spring sees the snows of winter on Tasmania's highlands begin to melt. As the winter recedes, the pure, snow-fresh waters dribble into bigger streams until cascades of water pour into the lakes and rivers. The water levels rise, swelling the tarns and rivulets, creating backwaters which pose perfect opportunities for the rewards of wet fly fishing. During spring, it's common for the trout to move into the backwater shallows, searching for food. This is known as tailing. The fish swimming into only centimetres of water display their dorsal fins and colourful backs. Despite their apparent disregard, they remain wily customers. 
As the spring weather improves, the warmer climate sees the fish improving in quality and condition. It also sees the first hatchings of mayfly in the streams of lower elevation. An opportune time for the dry fly fishermen. In the estuaries around Tasmania, spring sees whitebait massing near the banks, feeding and heading upstream to freshwater spawning grounds. This is the kind of fishing you won't find anywhere else in Australia. The sea trout come in from the oceans, feeding on the white bait as they battle their way upstream to lay their eggs. It's really exciting fishing. In this river, all in the coastal rivers, there's two species of white bait. There's the first run that comes well, about September. They're small, transparent ones. Then there's another run we call the anchovy. He's a bigger one, darker and stronger. And they're the ones the fish like to feed on. But they don't stay in the river, they go straight through. Nothing stops them. They'll go over a cement wall, over a weir, they'll get right in the edge where there's a trickle of water and they'll wriggle up and stick on and then a few more wriggles and then over the top they go. The trout naturally follow the easy feed and the angler with the right lure will usually have some luck. A small green or white matuka sized fly on a sinking line, a light green wobbler or a silver and green silter are often recommended along with natural bait. 1934 the business kicked off when dad first started it and we were looking for a variation to the theme so over a beer in a pub one night my brother and I decided okay why not look at fishing lures as a manufacture process. We're now exporting to uh, over a dozen countries around the world. It's uh, a business that grew far quicker than we thought it would. Uh, we're producing now some 86 different colours of lures, uh, which would just about satisfy the most ardent fishermen. Most of our colours are very effective, and I think this is proven by the fact that most guys come back in again and again saying, OK, we know colour number so-and-so is working particularly well in a certain area here or there or somewhere else. Uh, those colours are usually uh, fed from one guy to another guy. The variation in colours does mean that we can offer a condition situation whereby in the morning you can have a certain colour, in the afternoon another colour, evening another colour, and that probably brings up another point, I suppose. We're right in the middle of producing something different again for evening, which is a luminous lure. And that really stands out of a night. Something very different, but something we feel is going to be a real goer. By the time summer has arrived, insect hatchings increase, and most inland waters provide superb fishing. Stealth is the key. The warm weather sees many an angler polaroiding in the shallows or dry fly fishing the calmer stretches of inland water. When the fish are taking, the pleasures of this haven are sweet indeed. Come early autumn, the frosty nights are starting to complement the warm days and most fishing methods bring results. Rainbow trout seem to fall to the lure more often at this time. Spinning and trolling are effective. But so too is the dry fly, as autumn sees many a beetle or midge hatching and a resulting rise. Late autumn evenings are highly recommended for results. The onset of winter is when the fish ready themselves for spawning. The sea run trout begin heading into the estuaries and upstream. The browns spawn from May until July, while the rainbows spawn from August through to October. All fisheries are closed during June and July to ensure wild spawning is protected and this precious resource is maintained. Thousands upon thousands of fish gather in estuary and in stream. forcing their way against the strong current to the shallow gravelly beds where they'll spawn. Just as each generation before them has done, since only a few hundred fish were introduced in the 1860s. Hobart, Tasmania's capital, was settled in 1803 on the picturesque Derwent River. Once the colony had become established, the population missed many aspects of the old country, including trout fishing. 
Tasmania's rivers and streams, being fed by snow in a climate similar to that of Europe, were ideal for sport fishing. However, England lay 12,000 miles away, and the quickest transport were sailing ships, which took over four months to complete the voyage. The task seemed impossible. The earliest recorded suggestion for trout to be shipped to Tasmania was in 1841. Nothing eventuated, but the idea of trying to bring trout over instead of live fish originated at that time. In 1852, the first attempt met with failure, the overhatching and dying on the journey. In 1860, 30,000 Atlantic salmon over were shipped in ice. Again, none survived. The following year, the Tasmanian government formed a salmon commission. The commission constructed salmon ponds, the state's first inland trout hatchery in 1862. The site chosen was at Plenty, north of Hobart. For the next attempt, 100,000 Atlantic salmon over and 3,000 brown trout over were placed in 164 small pine boxes lined with living moss and packed in ice. They sailed aboard the Norfolk, eventually arriving in Hobart on April the 21st, 1864. 30,000 salmon over and 300 trout over survived the journey. The Atlantic salmon ultimately failed to sustain themselves in the wild, but the brown trout, of which almost all 300 survived to adulthood, were released and went forth to multiply. Establishing Tasmania's wild trout fishery and bringing generations of anglers the pleasure of sport fishing. The salmon ponds at the same site since 1862 have remained an important trout rearing facility for the Inland Fisheries Commission. Built on the Plenty River which flows into the Derwent, salmon ponds have seen trout hatched, raised and released for generations. Ponds are still a popular tourist attraction today and are well worth a visit. The Inland Fisheries Commission strikes its busiest period in late autumn when the trout head upstream in droves to spawn. It's the time when eggs and milk are taken to stock lakes which lack natural spawning channels and to meet the demands for trout over from other parts of Australia. The rainbow trout run into um, Lowany Canal which is the main input into Great Lake in the spring and um, the Commission has a trap on the bottom end of Lyony Canal. The fish are um, trapped, they're counted every day. When enough sufficient fish are um, collected to put into the spawning channels, they're moved in and within about 10 to 14 days, the rainbows have paired up. Um, the um, females have dug their egg nests and then after that time, once they finish spawning, the adults then drop back into the lake and we then maintain a gentle flow over the egg nests, which are also called reds, um, which are basically mounds of gravel in which there are several pockets of, of, of eggs uh, until they hatch, which is in about six to eight weeks' time. Uh, the fry, the, the juvenile fish that come out of the, out of the gravel, 
um, stay in the canal for a short time and then after that they drop back out into the lake. No trout fishing video would be complete without mention of the Shannon Rise, an epic story exaggerated by generations of fishermen, but remaining a most spectacular part of trout fishing history, which is now, it seems sadly, lost forever. The Shannon River was dammed by the state's Hydroelectric Commission in 1911, and the dam enlarged in 1922. The regulated flow of Cool Lake water in larger amounts suited the breeding needs of a species of caddis, the snowflake caddis would hatch in their thousands in early December each year along the river. Their numbers were phenomenal. Blizzards of snowflake caddis filled the air with thousands of dead flies filling the channels along the Shannon's banks. It was a spectacular sight to behold. And as a result of this yearly hatching, browns and rainbows would crowd into the river in huge quantities to gorge themselves big fish from the Great Lake and the Shannon Lagoon. The event was the most famous rise on earth. The day it occurred each year, telegrams were sent across the globe announcing it. Folk legend claims you could walk across the fishers' backs the water was so thick. Accommodation was so crowded, European aristocrats slept outdoors. Fishermen stood shoulder to shoulder along the banks, some getting flies caught in their ears, one gent in his tongue. These tall tales grew out of the greatest rise in history. It ended in 1963, when another hydroelectric scheme again altered the water flow, making it less favourable to caddis. The Shannon houses the odd smaller fish today, but the Shannon Rise remains a memory, perhaps Tasmanian trout fishing's greatest memory, as this rare historic footage shows. Where flows the Shannon is the scene of a world-famous insect rise where only dry fly fishing is allowed. In December, when the weather is right, the snowflake caddis moths hatch in their millions from cocoons long dormant on the river bed. The trout seem to wait for this day to converge on the short river and gorge themselves on the tasty insects. Word spreads among the fishermen too, and in hours after the rise begins, the banks of the Golden Half Mile are packed with anglers, pitting their skill and artificial flies against the surfeit of natural bait, which brings the fish from the placid reaches of the Shannon Lagoon into the swift running half mile stream which connects it to the Great Lake. It's grand fishing, this. These days, other Tasmanian waters grab the attention of the world's fishermen. Fish size varies from water to water. Part of the reason wild Tasmanian trout maintain large sizes is the native galaxia, small fresh water fish which are a ready food supply. Factors other than food supply which vary fish size include physical and chemical conditions, fish population and spawning facilities. Fish up to a kilogram can be taken in almost any water on light tackle. Or choose another water and you can expect to do battle with a true trophy fish.
the fish are abundant. The choice of water and tackle unlimited. You have the freedom to catch wild trout in the manner you enjoy most. To fish for trout in Tasmania, an angling license must be acquired. Full season or shorter term licenses are not expensive. A fishing code has to be adhered to and is supplied with your license. The code regulates waters and bag limits, types of fishing allowed on certain waters and so on. Fishing licenses can be obtained from most sports stores, police stations or from the Inland Fisheries Commission. The Inland Fisheries Commission is the organisation which controls trout fisheries in Tasmania. It's been in operation since um, 1860. It was formerly the Salmon and Freshwater Fisheries Commission and then became the Inland Fisheries Commission in 1959. It um, has the responsibility for all freshwater fauna as well as trout, but its main, um, I guess, charter is looking after the trout fisheries of the state. As such, it has a, has a pretty good reputation, I feel. Uh, it is solely a, an organisation responsible for one particular item, and that is freshwater fisheries, and that's quite unique in, in this country. And I think through its uh, system of angler representation, it's gained uh, a very good reputation for fisheries management and a uh, very good reputation for being in touch with what anglers really want. So when you purchase your licence in Tasmania, you can be sure that all the fees go back directly to the Inland Fisheries Commission to fund their trout fishing operations. The state government doesn't give any funding for trout fishing, so the Commission uh, uses all angling licence fees to fund its management, its policing, its restocking programs. The Commission has had a program of uh, stocking for a long time in this state and now most of the waters are naturally reproducing. They don't require any supplementary stocking, but there are some waters that haven't got adequate spawning facilities for which um, trout still need to be released. Lake Leak, for instance, hasn't got uh, adequate f spawning facilities. They don't always supply enough stock for the lake, so from time to time it requires restocking, and certainly the rainbow populations require supplementing. Right, I just keep an eye on them as you're taking them out. As you'll see from the code that's handed out with the licences, there are a number of different restrictions that apply to various waters around the state. So you must ensure that you're using the right method when you fish at a particular water. For instance, Little Pine and Penstock Lagoons are reserved for fly fishing, whilst uh, waters such as Lake Sorrel, you may only use artificial lures, so it's an idea to check the code before going fishing anywhere. The hydroelectric developments in this state have assisted uh, trout fishing quite a lot. Uh, they've provided good facilities for lake fishing. Uh, new developments on the west coast, I believe, will have some good prospects the Anthony Henty system has brook trout in it. These are quite unique and uh, we feel that uh, there could be some exciting fishing there in the next uh, few years. All types of fishing are enjoyed in Tasmania with waters to suit every angler. Baiting is permitted in many waters and natural bait fishing in most lakes and rivers can bring pleasing results. Fishing the Loon River in the south for sea run trout and escaped Atlantic salmon is highly recommended. For use of bait or lure, along with the Pyman River in the west, the Inglis River in the north is also a favourite. Fishing is constrained by law to one rod and line per angler, and set lines and hand lines are not permitted. Common baits for inland waters include wood grubs, frogs, grasshoppers in late summer, cockroaches and the ever-faithful earthworm. By far the most popular method of trout fishing in Tasmania is with artificial lures and spinning gear. Early in the season, many large sea-run trout are taken spinning in the lower reaches of estuaries.
A small wobbler with light tackle can have pleasing results in many streams. Spinning is equally successful in the lake country. Larger lakes lend themselves to boating and drift spinning or trolling. Large waters such as Lake Pedder and Great Lake can be very fruitful, bearing appropriately large catches. Again, advice from local fishermen or tackle shops will see you match a favoured lure with the water you're fishing. Probably you need something like this, John, around about five, five foot six, just a very light little outfit using sort of anywhere from one to three kilo line. Something small like this, and that'll do most of the jobs for you. If you're going to go to your lakes, probably something just a fraction heavier might be an idea. Something like this around about six foot six up to about four kilo line. Right, well that's the sort of rods you need, John, to use while you're up there. Yeah. Uh, we'll just go over here and have a look at some reels now, and I'll show you some outfits okay, and reels. Okay, fine, thanks. And John, you'll need a small reel such as this because you'll be fishing in small streams that'll be fairly well overgrown with, with trees and that, and you, this type of lures you'll be using will be silvers, small spinners, wonder wobblers, just small lures like that. And you'll need to be fishing with light lines so you can flick these small lures up under the up under the, the um, overgrown trees and that. You won't be catching huge fish, but the fish you catch this time of the year will be in really good condition. Wet fly fishing is commonly enjoyed all seasons on many lakes and streams. On many waters, boat fishing is popular, fish being caught with sink tip and sinking lines. In spring, when the rivers flood and the trout are tailing, you can experience the true glory of the wet fly. Big trout, backs and dorsal fins exposed, forage through waters mere centimetres deep and the patient angler can pit his wits against them. During spring, the larger, heavier patterns of matukas, fur flies and the like are effective, giving way to small nymph, caddis and beetle patterns in summer. Although the Shannon Rise is a thing of the past, prolific hatches still occur year-round in other Tasmanian waters, with good results. Hatchings of various insects in Tasmania's many streams are a highlight at different times during the fishing season. Caddis, beetles, grasshoppers, mayflies and midges hatch resulting in spectacular rises. A bit of local knowledge helps. Advice is always available. Little Pine Lagoon is renowned for large mayfly hatches. Similar hatches occur in many lakes, Arthur's Lake, Bronte Lagoon and Lake Sorrel to name only three. There are somewhere around about 30, 35 lakes of easy access and uh, many of them are connected with waterways of one sort or another. Hard fishing, very clear cold water, uh, wet flies early in the season and dry as the, uh, the warm weather comes up. We catch many of our fish in uh, six or eight inches of water, even half the fish, I can hear one over there jumping now in the canal, and half the fish is often out of the water and his head's stuck in the mud and you've got to get his head out of the mud and you've got to find what he's eating and how. It's very challenging, stalking individual fish and just wonderful fishing, very exciting. Yeah, because the thing about Tasmania is that all the facilities are so close, you don't have the big distances to travel like the mainland. Here you've got many lakes, all the facilities that you want, fishing 
around Bronte is as popular as anywhere. A lot of locals come here from other lakes and a lot of our visitors use it. And uh, people go from here on out to Lake St Clair. And it's all just so compact and close. If one lake's not fishing, you can be on another lake within 10 minutes, quarter of an hour. And this is certainly yeah. something that Tasmania's got. Yeah, this is true. And, and, and not only a variety of accommodation, but a variety of price too for the budget fellow up to the lake that wants to spend a lot of money. The other plus about the Tasmanian fishery is it's virtually all wild. The mainland has nothing but domesticated fish, and here we're fishing a true wild brown trout fishery, probably the best in the world. So a good idea to bring your own selection of flies with which you can fish a bit better if you've got confidence in them, but there are local fly tyres who will tie special patterns for you that'll suit the local conditions. Early in the season, nymphs going through to shrimps and snails, and then as the season progresses, the warm weather comes, duns of one sort or another, and particularly black spinners in this area. And late in the season, we fish uh, a lot of jacid beetles and gum beetles. When hatches aren't occurring, look for lakes in more heavily timbered areas. Lakes with wooded shorelines often see leafhopper and beetle falls on warmer days through summer and autumn. As the insects fall, the fish rise and the dry fly can be put to good use. There are many popular dry flies for all waters and conditions. While trophy trout continue to be caught in many of Tasmania's waters, certain waters are regarded as offering exceptional conditions for trophy fishing. Lake Crescent, accessible from Interlaken off the Midlands Highway, is a natural water surrounded by marshes, unique for the sheer size of fish it produces. Trout average between 1.8 and 4.6 kilograms, with even larger fish frequently being taken. This is due to the trout's almost exclusive diet of native golden galaxia, abundant throughout the lake. Camping grounds at Tea Tree Point border one of the best fishing areas. Other prize spots include the island, Sandbank Shore and Table Mountain Shore. A boat ramp exists and the most popular and fruitful fishing methods are spinning, trolling and baiting. Western lakes are a chain of lagoons, tarns and lakes grouped across the western central plateau. They offer an exhilarating combination of trophy fishing amidst what is widely regarded as some of Tasmania's most beautiful wilderness. Wildlife abounds. And the variety of catchments offer a variety of fish. Access in vehicles is allowed in some areas. Other fishing spots are for walkers only. The diverse scenery and the promise of great sport fishing attract many anglers. A good all-round fishing location is Lake Sorrel, north of Lake Crescent from Interlaken. Regarded as the state's premier fishery, it offers huge storage and the quality and quantity of trout are very impressive. Lake Sorrel is a natural water, offering rocky banks, marshes, small beaches and always excellent fishing. Self-sustaining populations exist of both browns and rainbows. The browns are the dominant species, but in recent seasons the rainbows have increased in number. Fish range in size, with the average fish being over a kilogram in weight. Large fish are also taken. At Silver Plains, launching spots exist along with camping sites. At Dago Point 2 there are camping sites as well as high standard toilet, picnic and launching facilities. Concrete boat ramps and a breakwater. Bait fishing is not permitted. Spinning is practical around the deeper shores to the east. Good positions include Dago Point, Point of Chillon, the Eastern Shore, Diamond Beach, Powell's Bay, and the hatchery shore. 
reefs exist in certain areas, some of which are marked with buoys. But boating remains popular, and along any of these shores, trolling gets results. In the warmer weather, hatches of mayflies provide for exciting dry fly fishing all over Lake Sorrel. The premium marsh areas are in the region of Silver Plains, Kemp's Bay, Robinson's Bay and Kermady's Bay. When water levels rise early in the season, these spots abound with tailing trout searching for tadpoles and golden galaxia among the reeds. Nowhere else will better wet fly fishing be found. Arthur's Lake on the Central Plateau was created in 1964 by a Hydroelectric Commission dam. It is also highly regarded and is equally as popular as Lake Sorrel. It's a very productive fishery, with the bag limit of 12 a day often being met. Brown trout sustain their own wild population and are prevalent. Fly fishing is an excellent proposition here with the marshy areas being worked by fish due to the extensive insect hatches. Trolling and spinning from boat or shore are also productive, usually sticking closer to shore. Camping grounds with a separate caravan parking area are to be found in several areas. And a public telephone is available at Flintstone. Several spots are home to private holiday shacks. Between this water and Lake Sorrel, the fishing is plentiful and popular. Mention has also to be made of Lake Pedda. This is a massive lake resulting from another hydroelectric scheme. Famed for the controversy of its flooding, Lake Pedda is now famed for its deep waters and the size of the catch it offers. In the 1970s, the average catch weighed 4.5 kilograms. Anything smaller often wasn't regarded as sport. Today, the average catch is around 1.5 kilograms but there are still plenty of three kilogram fish. Trolling on Lake Pedder is by far the most popular method. But fly fishing from November through to March gets results as hatchings occur. The trophy fish of the deepest waters are the domain of the spinners. Spoons and cobras are productive in most areas. Lake Pedda has a massive surface area of 24,000 hectares. At its southern end, near Scott's Peak Dam and in Edgar Bay, there are boat ramps. It's also possible to launch at Hermit's Basin off the Gordon River Road and near Ted's Beach at the northern end. Extensive camping facilities are to be found near the southern boat ramps on Scott's Peak Road, along with other accommodation at the northern end at Strathgordon. Picnic and day shelters are located at a variety of points. Lake Pedda is located largely within the Southwest World Heritage Area. It is breathtakingly beautiful. The scenery is unrivaled, making for an unforgettable fishing experience. Leaving the lakes to look at some of Tasmania's popular and abundant rivers leaves the angler with a seemingly endless choice. One of the most respected trout fishing river systems is the Macquarie. Set amidst rural pastures and willows, it offers rewards spinning and baiting, as well as excellent results fly fishing. Nymphing and tailing in the shallows, or rising after caddis flies in the evening, there's plenty of sport in this great fishery. In October, November and March, prolific rises occur when red spinner mayflies hatch. Famed for the red spinner rises, the Macquarie system is very popular. The hatch is also spreading into feeder streams as well. Brown nymph flies and red spinner imitations are favoured. It would be hard to find a better teacher than the Macquarie River. Learning to read these waters is an achievement. Average bags of four fish are common, mostly fighting browns, but rainbows are often taken along the river's mid-stretches. 
Other notable rivers include the Upper Huon in the south, Brumbies Creek near Cressy to the north, and Tyana River near Russell Falls, which offers unrivaled stream fishing. Stretching for 170 kilometres, the Huon River is where the largest officially weighed trout ever taken in Australia was caught in 1887. It fell to Tasmania's governor, a 13.27 kilogram brown trout. Boating is popular with ramps at Franklin and Huonville. It's a renowned fishery, fish averaging a kilogram and recommended spots including Castle Forbes Bay and Franklin although most spots along the river will produce results. The Huonville Bridge area is a favourite. More serious anglers often seek out the river's smaller tributaries. Brumby's Creek, set amidst green farmland. Three weirs act as storages and are highly praised as fisheries. Accessible by car from Poatina and Saundridge Roads, or by foot from Number 2 Weir, Number 1 Weir is popular for spinning and more often fly fishing. Number 2 Weir is small and weed choked, but does produce fish. Using a fly is recommended. Number 3 Weir is weedy in places, but near the bottom end of the catchment, there's ample room for using lures and baits. This weir is accessible by the road directly opposite the second weir. Most catches are magnificent. Browns of up to a kilogram or more and rainbows are taken in number three. Brumby's Creek is a fly fishing haven with many seasonal hatchings. At times, trout can be seen leaping from the shallow waters to take large flying insects in mid-air. I'm standing here at Brumby's Creek just out of the township of Cressy. This lots of water because it's running very full at the moment which is power scheme water so it, the water level does fluctuate here which often affects the fishing. In this bottom section here it's open to all sorts of fishing, fly fishing, spinning and, and bait fishing but there are areas further up that's just artificial lures only. The best things to work in this area for fly fishing are red tags, black beetles, uh, black and red spinners, that's in dry flies. Wet flies I'd use perhaps Hamel, Hamel's Killers, Mrs Simpson's, Machuca's, those sorts of things. Um, for spinning, probably redfin wobblers, um, spinners. And for bait fishing, worm is always very good here. For the fishermen wanting the best of stream fishing anywhere in the world, the Tyana River is ideal. The riverbanks are steep and overgrown in places, but it gives way to wadeable riverbeds and fly casting room is to be found. This is the most densely populated of trout waters, and browns and rainbows of 700 grams are average. One kilogram fish are common, while fish up to 2.5 kilograms can be taken. The bag limit is reached on Tyana River time and time again. Here, it's only been possible to show selected examples of Tasmania's fishing waters. There are over 3,000 lakes, tarns, lagoons, streams and estuaries highly regarded for premium sport fishing. They abound in wild trout. Huge man-made lakes and dams. New developments promising new fishing challenges, such as this one at Curry's River Dam, and natural waters thousands of years old. Tasmania is a last sanctum of truly wild fish, and the call to experience fishing these waters lures people from all over the world. The Tasmanian wild brown and rainbow trout have become legendary. This story holds a place in history. After this presentation, a list of valuable contacts is provided to make the Tasmanian fishing experience your own. The wild fish are waiting. <laughs>